You know, parents, uh, today's message, I think, is going to have some profound implications for how you look at raising your children in the faith, what your expectations are, and uh, what your focus should be. And so you're really on my heart, certainly, as uh, I speak these words today, because I think they're pretty countercultural, even countercultural as they relate to what a lot of the American Christian church is doing nowadays. So uh, you see the slide up there that has titled this message, You Are a Target. And uh, your kids are especially a target. Your grandkids are a target. And uh, we want to see what that means today and how Jesus Christ targets us. So you guys can go that way, that way. Yeah. There you Or do you want them over by you? No, that way is good. All right. All right. Um, there are some things that I think are stumbling blocks for the Christian faith for people, and uh, some of them are, are pretty large doctrinal stumbling blocks. For instance, Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God is truly divine, they think. He's a teacher, a prophet. And so our understanding of Jesus as being one in essence with God the Father and the Holy Spirit is, is a stumbling block to them. It keeps them away from the faith. And so you know, one of our goals is to help them see why we believe Jesus is who he says he is, why that's not foolish why it's transformative. Other stumbling blocks are just cliches. They're not doctrinal, so to speak. They're things that people just take to saying, and over time, people accept them as true. Uh, For instance, who here hasn't heard, all the church cares about is money? You know, (laughs) that's just not true. It's just not. And, And the church gives away so much money, and the church uses all of its money for the sake of sharing Jesus and for proclaiming the gospel, especially to people who don't know him. But for some people, that passing of the offering plate, and I'm sensitive to it, until people learn and understand it a little bit more deeply, it's a stumbling block. One stumbling block that I think affects all of us, uh, certainly at least some of the time, is the idea that Christianity is comfortable or that it's supposed to be comfortable and that our life in the church and as a Jesus follower is supposed to bring with it some tangible reward or make things better or easier. And that's not necessarily true. And for people who don't know that's not true, when they first start to realize it, it drives a lot of them away. They say, this isn't doing it for me. What I thought was going to happen isn't happening, and therefore, Jesus must not be worth following. He must not be who he says he is. He must not be loving. He must not be powerful and the like. I see this happening every single day, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. The Pastor Vogel and I have a a vantage point of people both inside and outside of the church where this myth is perpetrated. And and it's especially obvious uh, in the way that we parent our children nowadays. I'm tempted into this to believe that my children are supposed to always be stimulated and happy and content. And if they're complaining, then something must be wrong. And, you know, we know that's not true. And we know... And we should be able to see this. Every time we try to fix something in their life, rather than let them endure it and come out on the other side, we're actually causing them harm that's very long-lasting. And churches aren't necessarily always easy. Churches aren't always necessarily comfortable. A lot of churches are trying to be that. A lot of churches market themselves like that. And people from generally smaller churches are flocking over to those places, but it's not sustainable. The stuff that seems cool and that we say now, oh, we should do 20 years from now, it's going to be out of date. 
it, just like the stuff that was cool 20 years ago is out of date now today. The only thing that's the same yesterday, today, and forever is Jesus Christ. Uh, but beyond being unsustainable, uh, our comfort levels change. In here, I could do a survey and get hundreds of different answers on something. You, you have different backgrounds. You have different upbringings and uh, different gifts. We're comfortable with different things. And so that can't be the standard. It just can't. It's, it's, there's no way to meet it. In reality, we come and we recognize that a walk with Jesus isn't always comfortable. But we are always met by the great comforter. He comforts us in our distresses, in our sorrows, in our pain, in the midst of death. And he has a message that transcends all of the stuff that the culture promises to us. And so, you know, a message like, you are a target, or this introduction to the message, talking about life being not comfortable necessarily as a Christian, I don't know that I'd be hired by an advertising agency thus far. It's not a great hook just yet. I get that. It sounds like bad news to some people. I know that it gets the hair up on some people's necks, but just bear with me, please. Because what I really have for you is the best news in the world. I really do. And it is so much better than the stuff that the devil's trying to tempt us into believing. And so let's see how that all works out. The first question I want you to ponder as we talk about that is this. Is why do you obey? Why do you obey anyone? Why do you obey God? The religious mindset works like this. I am going to obey... Because by obeying, I will get a reward. And sometimes that works. Like you go to your job, you do a good job. It's not 100% of the time, which should tell us something. But you do a good job, a lot of times you get rewarded for that. And life kind of works that way in many facets. Parents who give their kids an allowance. What do you expect from them to get that allowance? Obedience. They have to do some chores. But when they do those chores, it's not really love, is it? It's not really the motivation you'd love to see from them. See, I think we all want our kids to behave, to do the things we set out for them because they love us. And they want to honor us. And they want to bring joy to us. That's love. That's true obedience. It's not really love for them to only do something if they're going to get paid for it. But that's the religious mindset. That is what separates Christianity from every single other world religion. It doesn't matter which one it is, every other world religion has at its heart this basic teaching that God is up there, you do something to appease God, and God will in turn do something to bless you. But that's not Christianity. Christianity actually tells us the exact opposite. It tells us there is nothing we can do to appease God or to make ourselves more in the favor of God. God is holy. We are broken. And we have this disease called sin. And the way for that disease to be cured has nothing to do with us being obedient and pleasing God. It has all to do with God coming down and making us pleasing in his sight. If you don't get that, if you don't understand that, God will always end up being a disappointment to you because religion says, I do this and I get a reward. <laughs> well, what happens when you don't get what you think you deserved or you expected? You're angry. And what happens if you do get what you expected? You're prideful and you think it came because of you. But Christianity, and Jesus tells us, everything we're given is undeserved. It's pure grace. We can only have a relationship with God based on grace. And a relationship based on grace is the only relationship that's going to last. All the other relationships are subjective and arbitrary and eventually impossible to meet. And they're exclusive then. 
Only Christianity is inclusive and says that this grace is offered to all people. There's only one person, one person ever, who had the favor of God the Father because of who he was and what he did. And that's Jesus Christ. And so today I want to take you through four quick points that are going to help you to understand why the Christian life isn't an easy life, but it is the good life, and why if our expectations change or are refined and renewed and strengthened, we are going to have a much deeper understanding and relationship with God than if we kind of just do the generic worldly idea of religious adherence. And so the first point is this. Know this, that no one has ever been more obedient than Jesus. This idea that uh, if you obey, you're going to get a reward should be refuted when we look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was more obedient than everyone who ever lived. Today, you heard the reading from Donna about Jesus' baptism. And, and this is what's so striking about Jesus' baptism. People were commanded to be baptized as a repentance, as a way of saying, I have fallen short and I need to be washed clean. Well, that wasn't true of Jesus, if he is who we say he is. Jesus did not need the forgiveness of sins. So why does he come and why is he baptized? It was obedience. Jesus was in this perfect relationship in heaven with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. They're a community. They're a relationship, perfectly honoring one another. And yet, this is the command that his father gave him. All those people down there, Jesus, they're not obedient. They're doing things that aren't loving to, to us and to each other. And, and then look at the chaos that's happening because of it, Jesus. You're going to go and you're going to save them. You're going to make this world right again. And you're going to make them right again. And so Jesus leaves the glory of heaven... And, and he comes into this uncomfortable life. Very uncomfortable life. He's born into a stable. His, uh, his upbringing, you know, he's got to hide early in life because people are out to kill him. His whole life was a mission and journey towards death. Uncomfortable life Jesus lived. No comfort there. But he comes to be baptized out of obedience to his father. He comes into this world out of obedience to his father to stand in our place. When Jesus went into the Jordan River to be baptized, he wasn't carrying any sins of his own. He was carrying our sins. That's whose sins he came to wash clean is yours and mine. And, and what was his reward? <laughs> this is so striking. It's, it's amazing how this plays out. Jesus is baptized. The Bible says that the Father proclaimed from heaven, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. And you know what the next verse is? It's astounding. The next verse is, and the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And this is what I want you to understand. Point number two. No one has ever suffered more than Jesus. Jesus was totally obedient he did not get a reward and an easy life out of his obedience. He got suffering right after hearing how he pleased his father. He's led into the wilderness to suffer. To an uncomfortable 40 days and nights. To hunger and thirst and to be tempted. And then he goes from there and begins his earthly ministry for three years, obediently doing the Father's will. And instead of attracting crowds that would be loyal to him, he attracted crowds that would turn their back on him and make him suffer upon a cross and die. He did that for you. He did that for disobedient people. He did that not for people who made him comfortable, not uh, for people who made his life better or easier. Jesus died for people 
who made his heart suffer and who made his body suffer. I want to contrast Jesus with a pretty significant event that happened in the world this week. And I want to preface this by saying I know not every person who claims to be Muslim is a terrorist. I know that. I'm not claiming that. Uh, and, And neither should you. But there are those who say this is the life, this is the religious life, this is the way to appease God, and everybody who is outside of this life is a threat. And so there are those who will kill those who believe otherwise. And and all uh, will struggle in living peacefully or uh, diversely with those who are outside of their religious viewpoint. But so you got these people this week in France who say, this is the life and you're not living it and, and you're, you're also being disobedient to my way of life. You're mocking it and therefore I will kill you. On the flip side, you have Jesus. And, and he, he looks at the world and he's, you're disobedient. You're not following me. Many mocked me. People spit on me. Those are the people I'm here to die for. I'm not going to kill them. I'm not going to discard them. I'm going to die for them. That's absolute grace and humility. That someone would do that for us and the whole world. Even those who don't deserve it. Which is all of us. Jesus suffered in that way so that you would always know that you're loved, so that you would always know that someone cares for you, so that you would know that there is someone who puts your life in front of his own, and if he would ask you, or excuse me, if he would do that for you, really, what would he ask from you that isn't for your own good? Isn't that hard to believe it sometimes, that the things that Jesus tells us are good I know we struggle sometimes believing they're really good. We let the culture define what's good and evil nowadays. And the stuff that he says isn't good for us, a lot of us are embracing it in our lives. And you know why that is? Because the devil's tempting us into believing we can't live without it or that we need it because if we don't have the life that we think will make us comfortable, then God is failing us. Point number three then. The presence of suffering is not the absence of God. That is the whisper in your ear. That is the nagging lie the devil is going to try to tell you. If you are suffering, then God is absent. I see this happen all the time with newer members in the church. We just started a new member class today, and so if you're in that, be on guard from this. And we're going to talk about it a little more. You're a target. You're a target now. The devil absolutely hates where you're at. He liked it when you weren't in a church. He liked it maybe if you were drifted away. He liked it uh, when you weren't uh, in a class growing and learning. And so maybe he left you alone, but now you're saying, I'm going to commit further. Oh, you're a target. And, and, and what happens is sometimes things don't go according to plan. Some things happen, and the devil's there. See, I told you. God isn't coming through for you. He doesn't love you. He's not powerful. And, and, and so then we start to look for something else that's going to fill us up. And uh, that's deadly. Suffering does not exist because God is absent. Suffering exists because we have thought we know more than God. Or we've pushed God out of our lives. It's that word called sin. It's a disease. And ever since Adam and Eve disobeyed, it brought suffering and and chaos and trouble into the world. Because God loves us, there's still a lot of good things, but we know things aren't totally as they should be. What's God allowing us to see in the midst of those moments? He's letting us know that we have an utter dependence on him. That all the other stuff that we've clinged to, it, it, it hasn't accomplished what we think it'll accomplish. It can't do for us the stuff it promises to do for us. 
showing us our utter dependence, and then even beyond that, he's pointing us to the greater reward in heaven. You have not been promised the comfortable life here on this side of heaven. What you've been promised is an eternal life that will stretch into your heavenly home. That's free from sickness, sadness, crying, pain, death, and all the troubles of this age. And it's going to be so good, it'll give meaning to all the junk here and now. And it's going to be so good that it's worth persevering through this broken world for. When we stand before Jesus face to face, we're going to see he, he suffered for us to bring us into an eternity of perfection and glory. The key of walking by faith is seeing beyond what's right here in front of us, right here and now, the stuff the devil is using to target us and to get us away from the faith, to see beyond it to what Jesus really has promised to us. And along the way, he says, I'm going to meet you where you're at. And I've given you gifts like this church, and I've given you my word, and I've given you this sacrament so that you can be strengthened for the journey. Because you're walking through a valley of the shadow of death. And it's hard. And yet you can fear no evil. And you will be with me and dwell with me in the house of the Lord forever. Because my rod and my staff, they comfort you. They comfort you in this uncomfortable life, as Psalm 23 tells us. And, and he cares for us so that we can walk through this life in faith together until that day we see him face to face and everything will be made brand new. And so we endure. And we recognize God is not far away. God is not absent. God is active in our life, walking us towards that day when we will never question his presence because we will be present with him face to face forever. And so point number four, remember then, overwhelming fear and hatred of suffering may lead to the absence of God. <laughs> That's what I was mentioning with the way we're bringing up kids nowadays. Oh man, uh, we are so afraid to let them endure. We really are. And, and churches have been even given this pressure. Like if they're not entertained every moment besides the fact that's not the purpose we're here and, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying I'm not saying they should be miserable I'm not saying they shouldn't get fussy they should get fussy they're kids I'm saying that we cannot live in this life so fearful of the bad things that happen believing that somehow God has let us down and what happens is we often go and look for something else to fill us up Ah, uh, I was home alone Christmas week and uh, Gail and the kids went to Wisconsin and so I had all this free time on my hands because the church office was closed and I was kind of just here for emergencies and I don't know how to fix anything so um, I didn't do any projects around the house and uh, <laughs> sorry ladies, I'm taken, she says. Um, <laughs> Um, so I watched a lot of TV and did nothing. And uh, <laughs> one show I watched uh, is a cable show. It was called The Affair. And I had seen it a bunch of times in like top 10 list shows for the year or whatever. And uh, so I watch it. And so you have these, this couple in an affair. And I don't think they even liked each other. The guy just felt like he needed something to make him feel more like a man because he wasn't being very successful and the woman needed something to make her feel more like a woman because she had lost her child and she wasn't feeling loved and so they thought each other would fill a void and that lasted a little time and then chaos ensued some of you are doing that or have done that in your life maybe you've had an affair like that maybe your affairs with a bottle or the end of a needle, or your kids' activities, or your job, or your beauty, or your popularity, or your money and your stuff. I don't know what it is. Food, exercise even, good
good things can become bad things when we make them God. And they can lead us away from God. In reality, there's only one thing that can fill us up. And so, so what are we being called to? What are we being called to? Love God just for who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. That's the life we're being called to. Jesus Christ was born into a discomforting life, an uncomfortable life, to die an uncomfortable death for you. And he, he did it in spite of the fact he's God, and he knows the essence of perfection. And one day, he's coming back again. You know who he is? He's holy and perfect and awesome. What did he do? He let go of that and he died for you. What will he do? He'll come back again for you and take you to your heavenly home. That's why we worship him. Not because if we come to church, we think that we're going to win the lottery as a reward. Or if we uh, come to church, instantaneously our marriage is going to be healed. Or whatever it is that people do. And, and it's not even just for good things, like raising our kids with Christian values and all of that kind of stuff. Because none of that is promised to us. None of that is going to automatically come to fruition. We worship God not to get a reward but because he is the reward. Because as we live our life, we say, there is no one who has cared for me, can care for me like he has. And, and he invites me into a relationship and he gives me his gifts and it's good to be with him. And if you worship him like that, you know what's going to happen in your life? You will be a target and you will be okay. I'm going to tell you, I, I didn't have a great upbringing. I've told you that many times. Some of my darkest moments have come as a Christian believer. It did not make my life easier. It's made my life harder in a lot of ways because now I know some things aren't good for me and I still am tempted to them. That's hard. And, and, and I also understand the way things should be. And so things hurt more when they're not. When relationships are broken, it hurts me more now than it did back before I was a Christian because I know they're not supposed to be broken. And, and I also know that I'm a target because the devil's trying to get me to fall so that this church will fall and the devil's trying to get you to fall so that the people in your life will see you and call you a hypocrite and so that they can have ammunition. You're a target. And sometimes it's uncomfortable and it's hard and we wonder if God's there. And so know that you will be okay. Know that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. What you do is you go into the word, just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the desert, and you let that be your armor. You let Jesus be your armor, and you will be okay. One thing, if you say, I'm not feeling this big temptation to go and do anything wrong, there's a good chance the devil has you right where he wants you, friends. Because, because what's happening is you're saying, my morality is what saves me, not Jesus. And some of you are saying, I'm not uncomfortable. Things are pretty easy. You know what? The devil has you right where you want you. You're religious, but you're not necessarily following Jesus. You're not growing. You're not being challenged. You're not learning. You're not uh, committing. And, and when we're out on those fringes, sometimes life's pretty comfortable. When we get in with Jesus, it's hard. He says, pick up your cross, follow me. You will suffer on account of my name. Uh, drop everything and follow me and Go! We won't do that with a pep talk. We won't do that with mere religious motivation. We will do that when we know who he is. When we know what he's done. And we know what he is yet to do. He comforts us in the midst of this uncomfortable life. He comforts us with the promise that one day we will be in the comfort and glory of heaven forever and ever. We're not there yet. And so today, be comforted with the good news. Your sins are forgiven. Be comforted with the good news. God will provide for you. Be comforted with the good news. God cares for you. He will not forsake you. He knows your name. You are baptized just as he was baptized, and you are washed clean, and you are beautiful in his sight. Be comforted with the good news that whether you live or you die, you belong to the Lord. Be comforted with the good news that one day your treasure is in heaven and so you don't need riches here and now. Be comforted with the, the good news that your name is written on the book of life. So who cares if everybody gives you accolades here and now? Be comforted with the good news that Jesus left the glory of heaven to come and die for you and he rose again and he will come again for you and you will live in comfort forever and ever with Jesus. Amen.